the Bible in Ephesians chapter 2 says that you have been created anew in Christ Jesus to be someone absolutely amazing. And we are going to learn today that that has an awful lot to do with this idea of influence. Speaking of men of influence, I want to bring your attention to a man that you well know. His name is Bill Gates. Bill Gates, uh, for 13 years in a row, was the world's wealthiest man with a net worth of $88 billion. That was until uh, several years ago when he decided to give away a big chunk of that fortune. In fact, one-third of it, $28 billion dollars. This guy has given away to charities, education, vaccinations, and the like around the world. And I was curious, you know, uh, not only where does it go, but why did he do it? I mean, why does this guy stand out as a person who gives away a major chunk? I've never known any other uh, person of that amount of means to, to give it away. So I started looking that up this week and reading some articles in Forbes magazine and others. I found out that Bill is very clear as to why he is the way he is with his resources. He points to the influence of his mother. The influence of his mother. Two ways. His mom modeled it for him his whole life. He remembers many memories as a boy going down to not-for-profit type of uh, campaigns and opportunities, serving people that didn't have a voice and helping them uh, just move forward in life. She was always doing that. But a bigger influence that he points to was the letter that she wrote to him right before she passed away. She died early uh, from sickness. And the letter says in there, and this was before Bill was the mega mogul that he is. It says this, Bill, to whom much is given, much is to be expected. I wonder if she ever thought that her little letter and that her influence by her modeling would ever vaccinate a quarter of a billion children around the world. This is important, friends. We must realize how significant our influence in the hands of God can be in this world. In fact, the big idea for the whole series, take your sheet, if you will, pull that out there and fill in this big idea for the series. God expects us to be good managers of our influence. God expects us to be good managers of our influence. Now, here's something that I think I know about you because I know this about me. Some of you are coming comfortable with the idea of influence. You like thinking of ideas and creating ideas, and you know those ideas work, so you can't wait for other people to benefit with your genius. So you're welcome to influence other people in your life. Others of you are probably a little bit more hesitant with influence. You're willing to do it, but only in an area where you have a measure of expertise. For instance, if you're a nurse or something like that, and you go to a ball game and someone gets sick, you're willing to exert some influence because you know that you can be of help. If you're a sporting person, you'll coach a team or something like that. Others of you, I'm guessing, just guessing, look at the idea of influence as a negative thing. I don't want to force my opinion on anyone. I want everybody to have their ability to make their free choice and things like that. That might be where you are. Others of you are perhaps even saying, you know, I really haven't amounted to much. I have nothing to offer. I want to go back to the song and back to the verse and the idea in the scripture that you are somebody if you've been created anew in Christ. God says that your influence is extraordinary because it's a beautiful thing. It's amazing to me. Well, let me, let me just give a caveat first to this because I know that some of us are probably in that place where we don't want to influence. Take a, take a look, if you will, at, on your notes there. We've got to distinguish early on between the, diff the difference between godly influence and kind of influence gone bad. Be between godly influence and manipulation or godly influence and coercion. I've got to be honest with you, throughout the centuries of the church's history, there's been an awful lot of influence that's been coercive and manipulative and ugly and doesn't represent the character of Christ at all. We're not talking about that kind of influence. We're talking about godly influence. And if God is a God of love, then his influence is going to be love. So look at it. The motive of godly influence has got to be what? It's got to be love. Write that in the blank, if you will. But it's not just the motive. I mean, our desire to influence can't just be love alone. Our actions and how we do it must be love as well. So not just the motive, but the method of God, godly influence has to be loving. Now, here's the thing that just, that just trips me out. Jesus was that, and it's resulted in him being the most influential man that ever walked on the face of the earth. Check it out. He was only a, in public ministry two and a half to three years. 
in an obscure land. Never wrote a book, never went for political office, never campaigned for anything other than the kingdom of God. And there's never been more books written about him or money spent toward him or people committed to him than any other person in the history of the world. He must have had some type of amazing influence for his influence to be so strong. That's what we're going to tap in today. I want to give you five reasons why you should be a person that uses that godly influence and shares it with other people. The first one's this. The world is not neutral. Write that in your blank, if you will. The world is not neutral. There are many ungodly influences out there that are vying for your heart's attention. I uh, have little kids, and at one point, they were going on to a Disney Channel kind of uh, thing online to interact with more games and stuff, and a porn site had gone and got all the little sites around that site so that if they missed by one keystroke, they had land there. They're after you. Satan, it's, you know, the Bible says, is a roaring lion looking around to devour anybody that he can. The world's not neutral. We've got to engage this influence that Jesus brings to us. Second thing is, your influence is not neutral. Your influence is not neutral. Dan talked about this last week. The influences in our life and our influence in our life, they're not neutral. We have actions. We have attitudes. Those reflect our character for good or for bad. So we've got to be intentional about that. Here's another thought here. No influence influences. Think about that for a second. Some of us are growing up to adulthood and, and parenthood, and you're kind of looking back on your own parents going, why didn't you influence me a little bit more? You could have saved me some headaches, you know? And if that's the case, then we know that even our lack of influence influences, so our influence is not neutral. The third reason here is that discipleship implies influence. I'll tell you why in just a minute, but let me just give you this thought. If you're a follower of Jesus and you are not influencing others, you are simply a student of Jesus, not a disciple. Okay? Hold on to that thought. I'll tell you why in a minute. It's not to be hard or crass or anything, but it's just to say a part of discipleship is passing that influence on to others. The fourth one is the reason why, and this is a big one. I'm going to camp out here for just a few minutes, and that is Jesus commissioned us to have influence commissioned us. Now, here's where we're going to kind of discover what that influence is, the godly influence is, and why we're supposed to do it. Look what it says here in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Would you circle the phrase all authority in heaven and on earth? That is a crazy statement. A crazy statement. Jesus is saying, it's all been given to me. Now, let me just walk you a little bit through Jesus' life here so that we can see it. When Jesus started teaching, he, he would teach and great crowds would gather around and they would say, man, this guy teaches as one who has what? Authority. They're like, wow, this guy gets it. He's just not going, wah, 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 wah. I mean, there's something that's coming alive in me as he teaches. He has authority. And the, the, the disciples of Jesus were out in a boat one day, and this huge storm comes up, and they're all scared to death that they're going to die. Jesus wakes up from his little nap, speaks a couple of words, and it all goes away. And they said, wow, this guy even has authority over the wind and the waves. He's got authority over nature. He had authority to forgive sins. He had authority over demons. Jesus had all authority in heaven and on earth given to him. And what did he do with it? Look what it says for the rest of the verse. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. In other words, he said, I now pass it to you. Go. You have the authority, one, to change the spiritual nature of an individual's heart because of the Spirit's influence in you. You can do that as you share. You can actually change a person's actions and attitudes, helping them to obey everything that I've commanded you because of the godly influence I have placed in you. Discipleship implies influence. And here's the last thing. Here's, the, here's the, probably the funnest reason of all. God's influence is good. It's good. Look at what all these people said in Matthew 9. They praise God for sending a man with such great authority. It's almost as if they were saying, thank goodness, God, you finally sent somebody here to make something out of this mess of a world that's down here. He makes sense out of things gone bad. He helps things go well with you. Thank you for that. Don't you think that we, as his representatives now, if we would just simply allow that authority to change us, 
could make a huge difference in the world. That's where we're going. So, the question that now becomes the front of our, our mind is this. How do, we, how do we do that? I want to offer you a better question than how do we do it. Because my assumption is that if we try on our own to exert influence, we end up making a mess. Okay? But if we allow that authority of God, all the authority in heaven and on earth that was given to Jesus to be a part of who we are and to let it work through us, it's amazing. Here's the better question. How do we prepare our hearts to allow Jesus to have that influence through us? What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about two ways that we can do that. I'm going to spend about 15 seconds, not really, but not much more on the first one because it's received tons of airplay in the church forever. So I'm going to just tap it, and then I'm going to go right into the second one, and then I'm going to show you how these two things work together, and I'm going to try not to explode as I go through this because this is some of the most exciting stuff that I have just kind of had some insight into in, the, in, in recent months. First one is this, let God transform your character. Let God transform your character. There's this movie series out there called Transformers, and it's these big robots that can change, you know, uh, shape and all that in order to accomplish their mission. And what Jesus has said to us is, I'll come and I'll metamorphosize, I'll transform, I'll change your character, and that's a part of accomplishing the mission that I have given to you. What can we allow, our, allow God to transform our character into? See if you like this guy or this gal. It's the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, <sighs> patience, one day, <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All the things that we long to be, God has said, I can do that in you. All those things that you like in other people, all those things you love about Jesus, God's Spirit says, I can do that in you. Just let me. Just let me. Just let me. Here's all I want to say about this one right here. Never be satisfied with where you are. Celebrate the wins God gives you in your life when it comes to your character, but never be satisfied. Until you're exactly like Jesus, you've got some more to go. So keep pushing, okay? Okay. Quite honestly, 95% or more of all messages, curriculums, and books have been given to help you let God transform your character. So I'm done with that one. I'm going to go to one that I believe that we've kind of been negligent on, and it's this one. Let God optimize your calling. Let God optimize your Calling. Sadly, this idea of calling has been reserved for uh, those of us who do this for a living for pastors, for clergy, whatever words you want to use. They've been called by God to do something different. This is a tragedy in the church. This is a tragedy. It's, it's, it's looking out at everyone who doesn't do this for a living and says that somehow the spiritual skill set and passions that I've put in your life are a little bit less meaningful than the others or will have less impact than the others. Ridiculous thought. How do I know this? Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. This is kind of the verse that I opened up with. It says this. You are God's masterpiece. You're created anew in Christ Jesus so that you can do the things that he planned for you long ago. Some of you needed to hear that you're a masterpiece. Because when you woke up this morning and looked in the mirror, you didn't go, hmm, well done, God. You know, <laughs> you know great job. I mean... We tend to see the broken part of, our, 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 of who we are. God says, no, 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 no. I've created you to do something. Would you circle that last phrase down there? To do the good things he planned for us long ago? I mean, circle that really big because you can't miss that. God has a role for you to play in the building up of his kingdom. And if you don't do it, there's a hole in the kingdom. And here's the thing. God made you able to fill that better than Billy Graham or Dan Sutherland ever could do. A masterpiece that only you can fill. Wow. Well, how do I do that? How do I find out what those good works are for me to do? I hope that's a question that's on your heart. Two clues that the Scripture give us. The first one is your spiritual gifts. That's what the Bible calls them. I like to call them my, my, my spiritual skill set. 
because I'm used to that kind of language out in the market. This is the skill set, the spiritual skill set God's given me to help me build the kingdom. And look, it says that everybody has one. 1 Corinthians 12, a spiritual gift is given to who? Each of us. That's everyone so that we can help each other. Another translation says, for the mutual edification of the body, for the building up of God's kingdom. We all have a spiritual gift because we've been created anew in Christ Jesus. The second clue, and by the way, let me just say this. That's an ability, that's a, the, the spiritual gift is something that you can do well. There's a list of them, teaching, management, leadership, encouraging, pastoring, counseling, healing. There's all kinds of those uh, abilities, skills, gifts that are listed there. That's what you can do. But the second clue to this is, where do I do it? Where do I do that? And that hooks into our passion. The, the notes, uh, the verse isn't in your notes, but it's Psalm 37, 4. It says, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, then God will give us the desires of our heart. He'll cause us to have a passion for things. I mean, have you ever watched a video here at Westside or, or somewhere else where, where you see kids that that through Westside or other ministries has pulled kids off of the street and, and fed them and taken care of them and you know that they won't be trafficked anymore and all that and your heart just starts to do this. That's probably because God's given you a passion for that kind of a ministry. If you uh, love it, uh, coming to Vacation Bible School or hearing about Vacation Bible School in the summer and you just can't wait to hear how many kids surrendered their heart to Christ, you probably have a passion in there for children. And so you take that gift that you've been given, teaching, pastoring, counseling, whatever, and then you take that gift and you apply it to that area where you have passion. And that's your calling. You put those two together, my gifts plus my godly passion equals my calling. Can I ask you something? Is God cool about doing it that way or what? I mean, he could say, I've got a job for you to do and you're gonna hate it. It's sweeping stuff or whatever vacuuming in heaven for eternity. Give me a break. No, he, he, he does it. He gives us the ability to do it and to do it well and to do it in an area where we know it's going to make a difference, have influence, live an impact for the kingdom of God. That's crazy good if you ask me. So if that's the case, Brian, then help me understand something. How do I, how do I figure out what my gifts are? How do I figure out what my passions are? Two things I just want to throw out to you here. The first one is this. Um, you got to just, just discover it and then develop it before you can optimize it. Discover is easy. Look on the, the notes there. You see a website. That's the website here at Westside where you can go on and take a thing called a shape assessment. It takes you about 30 minutes. It's free. You do that, and what it'll do is it'll spit out for you your most likely top gifts. And it'll top, tap out for you your most likely passion areas and places for you to go and try them out. Where do you try them out? You try them out as you volunteer. You might be thinking, man, you're just trying to hook us into going and volunteering, man, and building this big machine. Well, no. Here's the deal. What do you do when you get in there? You test and see if it works. And you ask yourself a couple of questions. Am I having fun? Because if you aren't, you didn't hit the right spot. Don't continue because you're going to ruin it for somebody else. Does that make sense? Yeah. If it's fun, great. If, you ask, if it is, you ask a second question. Is God getting something done here? Is God actually having an influence on somebody else's life? If the answer is yes, you found your sweet spot, but you're not done. Why? Because it's more of a lab than it is a place to just go do rote work. And the lab is this. If you find out that, yeah, that's my gift, look around at the leaders in that room and say, what do you see in me? What potential do you think I have? How far up this ladder do you think I can go? I mean, I've, I've taught well or I've encouraged well or I've pastored. Is there a way I can pastor people that pastor people? I want to have the greatest amount of influence in the kingdom of God as I can possibly have because I want to know what God wired me to do and I want to do it. Does that make sense? I'm here to work myself out of a job. And it ain't because I don't love my job. It's because I love more and more people sensing their realm of significance and growing in it like crazy and then watching God influence the world in a way we all long for him to do. Now, let me show you quickly how these things, two things work together. This is where I just start to go a little bit. 
If you take it and you look at it, you got the fruit of the Spirit, which is character. This is the math problem in your notes, right? You take the gifts of the Spirit, which is our calling. If you times those two together, you get eternal influence. How do you have influence? You let God transform your character, and you let God optimize your calling. That's how you have influence. Now, watch something. I'm going to do a little bit of math. Now, this math is nowhere in the Bible, but it's all over the Bible. Just watch. Let's say a person, let's say a man is in the secular world, he's got a great skill set of leadership. He's a six out of 10, so to, let's say, in leadership. So right next to that uh, gifts of the Spirit, put a six. This guy is ready to jump in, okay? Uh, but his character at this point is a two. When it comes to self-control or whatnot, he's uh, not doing real well. A couple times he'll go to sites on the web that he shouldn't go to. And when it comes to uh, faithfulness, he's really not there as far as giving and some time with God and all those things. There's room to grow in character. But let's say two. Two times six is what? Well done. Thank you for that. And uh, <laughs> a relative influence of 100 is only 12. Watch what happens, though. Watch what happens. If this guy says, you know, Phipps asked me to, what's my next step? Um, my next step is obviously character. I've got to bump character up. Okay, so he goes and he talks about a character thing and does a group on the fruit of the Spirit, and he bumps that thing up three points. Goes from a two to a five. What's five times six? It's 30. It's more than twice the influence that he had the previous semester. Okay? Now watch what happens here. As the influence goes up, so does a sense of genuine significance in your belly. And if a sense of genuine significance goes up in your belly, your, your tendency to do stupid stuff in character goes down, so your character goes up. And if your character goes up, then your influence goes up. And if your influence goes up, that's more, since, you know, <laughs> do you see how it just builds itself up? It just stair steps itself into significance. It's almost as if God had something to do with that. I'm, I'm blown away at the simplicity of this and the power of this. And I've seen it in many people's lives. Now, let me tell you what else I know. Let's say that what's, what I think's happened has happened and that most of the airplay in our churches for forever, me included, has been about character. And you somehow managed to get an 8.5 in character, but your calling is zero? What's your influence? What's God going to hold us accountable to? It's not just the character. It's not just the calling. It's the influence. What'd you do with what I gave you? Now, friends, this is going to take a lot of intentionality on your part. I, I think you'll be blown away at how creative God can be with your intentionality. Okay? But, man, it's worth it. It's worth it. My name's Abby Damon, and I've been helping in the reef with um, one and two year olds for about five or six years now. Well, I started serving when my daughter was about one year old, and they had asked the parents who had kids in the reef to help just once a month, and so I felt obligated because my child came, so I started helping once a month, and you know, I liked it, and I told them if they needed subs the other weeks to go ahead and call me, and, and they did, and I just eventually you know, committed, and I decided to be in a classroom regularly so I could see the same kids and the same parents, and I started helping every week. We're not just serving the kids, but we're serving their parents as well, and I remember being in church one time, um, and they were doing baptisms and so you know we were just sitting and watching and a guy came up that I recognized and it was the dad of one of the little girls that I had in my room every week and he was getting baptized and it was just so cool you know I just got tears in my eyes because I realized not only was I teaching his daughter but while I had her for the hour every week he was in church you know learning about God and obviously committing his life to Christ. I'm doing a lot more than babysitting these kids. I'm I'm teaching them about God, but I'm also allowing their parents to sit in church and be able to focus and not uh, be interrupted, but they can sit there and hear the sermon and they can hear the truth about God and He can speak into their lives uh, because I'm caring for their little ones. The kids that I had when I started that were one and two, I help in the rock as well, the kindergarten through second graders, and so I'll see those kids up there singing, doing the motions to these songs, singing about God, singing about Jesus, and you see, you know, they understand now, they get it. Let 
Let me tell you what I see as I work through the halls and through the week, get to meet more and more and more of you and hear your story. What I see is this. I see some of the most educated people in the world. I see some of the most resourced people in the entire world. I see some of the most talented people. I see some of the most skilled people. I see people who have every ability to take where they are and make it 10 times better. And I can't help but to think about what Bill Gates' mom said to him. To whom much has been given, much is to be expected. But there's something that motivates far more than that. And I want you to hear what Jesus said at the end of his life. It's a prayer that he prayed for his disciples. But it starts with a prayer straight to God. And this is what he says. God, you granted your son authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you've given to him. Remember, he's saying, you've given me that influence. And then he says this, I've brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Wouldn't you like to get to the end and be able to say that to God? Check. Did it. And it was a ride and a half. You can do that. If you allow God to transform your character, if you allow God to optimize your calling, one thing, three things will happen right here. One, God will receive glory. Write that in your blank. Second one, many will receive life. And finally, you will receive satisfaction in a job well done. Significance. Fill in the blank with whatever you want. I just encourage you, go for it. Go for it. Go for it.